Here we go. Okay, John, I'd love to know that moment when somebody approaches you about playing Oliver Hardy because on spec, you don't look like Oliver Hardy. <laughs> well, it's funny because I look more like him than I realized. Because um, really what the makeup is is really just weight, you know. They didn't alter the, the, um, the bone structure of my face or change my ears at all or anything. And if you look at Oliver from behind, <laughs> he actually does look like me or like anyway like my dad or when one of my uncles looked when they were older um so that was that was an interesting part of getting into the character was was at first i was like oh no no i'm not qualified i'm not nearly as good as oliver hardy i never will be i don't look like him and i'm not big like him and then each step along the way i started to get closer and closer and realized that i actually was uh, I had more things in common with him, with him than I realized. Um, certainly the sort of romantic side of our personalities. And, uh, and yeah, the physical attributes. Yeah, on the face of it, I don't look so much like him. But with just a little extra weight, I do start to look like him. I think you can see in the film um, another thing that was a huge uh, sort of game changer in terms of the way I looked was I wore brown contacts in the movie, which... Uh, even my own family, when they would see me like that, wow, like it's, it really does seem like someone else. You mentioned the weight. There were, there were, John was telling me about the weight suit, mm -hmm. the weighted suit. Yeah. Uh, not just padding, but I mean, that must have been, you must have been exhausted at the end of a given day. Yeah, I added weights inside of the fat suit because, uh, you know, I've seen, I've seen fat suits work not so great before where it just looks like it's, it has no heft to it, you know. You can see there's just an actor in there hopping around like a mascot or something, you know. Um, and I wanted, when I moved, to have a reminder that, like, you you know, not to say that Oliver ever drooped or hung low. In fact, he used to, you know, he would sort of carry himself from the center of his chest, like in this very dignified, graceful way. Um, but yeah, that fat suit and the makeup and the wig and the contact lenses, all that was exterior stuff. Um, which in a way like I didn't even see as my job, you know, the exterior stuff was was expertly handled by other people My job was going inside the guy's persona and figuring out Why was he like he was you know, why did this just how was this gesture developed or this tie twiddle? You know, like what does that mean about a person if they do that if that's their sort of psychological gesture, you know, it's really just uh, an, an increased version of themselves um, especially in Oliver's case because he was a romantic and he was someone that enjoyed the finer things of life and poetry and flowers and women and so, you know song uh, so that was a beautiful part of getting to know him and in that way I felt like well I'm, I'm actually really pretty similar to, to the guy in that way um, I had the luxury of being able to take off that fat suit at the end of the day which which he didn't and I know that you know that's another thing that I, that I developed was a lot of empathy for Oliver as time went on because you realize like that's a lot to carry around you know it's one thing to be paid for it and to entertain people and make people laugh but then you get the whole rest of the day to get through and you know in the 1930s being that big was very unusual you know, there's a lot of big people in our world now we're all very well fed and taken care of but in the 1930s during the Great Depression to be someone big like that you were a real freak you know you're not you were not like everyone else and that that weighed heavily on him despite the fact that he's always very charming and graceful about it if you look into the what he said about it you know he struggled with this weight it was a problem to him uh, and then there were there were even periods of time when the, when he would say like I th I think I need to lose some weight and the studio would go no 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 we want you just like you are uh, which had to be a struggle you know one thing I like that you brought to the role and and I did not know about him but you see it in the opening sequence which is that nice long extended uh, tracking um, he's the the people loved him on on set he was so charming so nice to everybody yeah. did you know that about him before you started well you can see it in their work you can see in the work of Laurel and Hardy that they were humanists you know they didn't rely on kind of smart Alex cynical humor or even contemporary references 
they relied on some eternal truths about the human condition and they had a lot of sympathy and empathy for the world. So you could see that in their work and then anytime you, you, you look at any of the footage, like newsreel footage or, you know, for instance, Stan Laurel spent the, his retirement answering fan mail. If you wrote him a letter, he wrote you back himself on his typewriter. So that shows you a level of commitment to the audience and, and a care for human beings that, um, that was definitely there. And certainly, you know, Oliver, Oliver was a very charming guy, uh, despite the fact that the, the audience asked a lot of them. You know, I know just being an actor that some days when you go out in the world, you just, you just want to get about your day. You don't want to have to stop and talk about your work or whatever. You just want to, you, never, you need to pick up your kid from school or whatever it is. But Stan and Ollie, no matter what they were doing, they would honor that pact with the audience. They would stop and perform for them, you know. And we play with that a little bit in the film. We show like even in, you know, checking into a hotel room, <laughs> they they feel obligated to to give people a little bit of a show or at least surprise people that didn't know they were coming. Yeah, you could see them going into their act without even meaning to. Sometimes I'm thinking about the the suitcase going down the the steps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's one of the playful things about the film. We deliberately uh, try to echo their work in their lives in our film because that's that's one of the things we decided early on. We're not going to try to replicate Laurel and Hardy. We don't need to. Their films exist. It's never been easier to watch their films. Um, we were after something that you can't find out on Wikipedia. You know, we're after something that that transcends the facts of their life that gets at the emotional truth of their lives and, and their relationship. But you did have to replicate the, the iconic dance. And yes. uh, how, how long for you and Steve to, to feel like you had it down? Well, it was a bunch of weekends before we even started rehearsing in earnest. I was doing another film in London at the time and we rehearsed on the weekends on my days off. Just because we knew this way out west dance, we wanted it to be absolutely perfect if we could, as perfect as we could. Because that's the one thing in the film that we tried to replicate exactly, including the mistakes that they made during the dance. You know, it's the steps are one thing, and then it's the little shambling kind of, you know, the looseness of the dance was, was something that we really had to study almost forensically. Uh, so yeah, that was very important for us to get that exactly right, because it's the one place in the film where we try to say, well, this is exactly what they did. The other stuff is inspired by, or, or we took a little artistic license because there's no film that exists right. of those tours. So we had to kind of find, find the act based on written accounts and some of the scripts. Wanna, we're an awards website, as you know. I want to ask you a couple of awards questions. Until Michael Stuhlbarg last year, he got his three of his movies were up for Best Picture. That year you were nominated. You had three Best Picture nominees. Was uh, tell me just about the the impact of that year for you as an actor. Well, I'm not trying to throw shade on Michael Stuhlbarg, but <laughs> I was in three of five Best. Three of five. He had three of nine. Only be five. Now there's <laughs> now there's right. up to ten or whatever. So who knows? People might never match that moment. Not to say that I had anything to do with it. You know. I was in those movies. Those movies were lucky enough to be chosen as best picture. Well, you don't have a, um, you don't know when they're all going to be released when you're shooting them. Exactly. They happen to be released in the that same year. year. There was a real accident that they were released because you know the distribution schedules changed according to some events in the world at that time. But th I made these back to back. Yeah. You know, I made Holmes and Watson followed by Stan and Ollie followed by the Sisters Brothers and Wreck It Ralph all throughout. You know where I could I was recording record Ralph so what you see is is what I was doing you know like there was a reason that they're all coming out back to back this year because they were made that way and that year at the Oscars do you have a, a, a memorable moment a story from from going as a nominee that year I know you've been other times I just remember uh, no I actually have never been other times I've only been to the Oscars once um, uh, oh no! And I went as, as a performer. You, you but, sang with Will Ferrell, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, but that was that just was... as a performer. I just came for the act, and like I wasn't, uh, I didn't have the experience of, you know, sitting there among the other nominees. Um, yeah, the, what I remember from that night at the Oscars was knowing pretty much every single person that went by the aisle <laughs> on their way to collect their award. Right. 
you know, being in that many movies, I actually had four movies that year too. The Good Girl wasn't nominated for Best Picture that year, but it was another movie I had come out that year. So as people would head down, you know, it's like there would be one person to kind of, you know, say I'm sorry to, <laughs> and there would be another person like, congratulations, man, you know, like, I just remember the balancing of that, trying to be really happy for the people who had won and commiserate with the people who had lost because I knew them all, you know, right. was, I had worked with them all. You've been a voter ever since then or, or right around then, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you like do, do you like that process? Do you like the uh, doing the nominations and then the, the winners? Uh, not especially. You know, I, I'm really honored to be a member of the Academy, but I have to say I got into acting because it was a not a competitive sport. <laughs> I tried wrestling and I didn't like competition. I didn't like one person winning, one person losing. I like doing plays where if the play went well, everyone wins. The audience wins, you win, you know, like the whole cast wins. Um, so this idea of codifying things into some sort of competitive sport, I personally don't agree with. The part I do agree with, and, and, the, and the part that is really satisfying and gratifying to, to get to do at the end of the year as an Academy voter, is to honor people in our business, to say like, hey man, good job. It's like salesman of the year or something, uh, for, for uh, shower ring salesman or something, you know? And ultimately, I think that's what the Oscars really should be. It should be for our industry to say like, look what we did this year, unless uh, a thing of like the Super Bowl you know, where, where fans are obsessed with the competition of it. I think it should just, should just be a celebration. If I had my druthers, if I ever became the president of the Academy, I would just, I would make the uh, winners known beforehand, you know, and just say it's a celebration of, of all the great stuff that happened this year. Of course, television ratings would plummet, but... <laughs> well, so that's what they do with the honorary Oscars. Everybody that's getting those on that night in November knows... The, the, you know, they're, they're getting that prize that yeah, night. Yeah, there's, no, there. there's no the winners or losers. Thing. It was a lot of fun, I have yeah. to say. I went to the Governor's Awards this year, and it was really cool. Well, thank you so much. Everybody's about to go see Stan and Ollie, and I, I think they're going to enjoy it from the nostalgia, but also it's such a, such a fun and touching story at the same time. Well, thank you very much.